I completed everything in Like a Dragon Gaiden, and it was pretty fun. It's really exciting to get to play new Yakuza games, and Like a Dragon Gaiden definitely didn't disappoint. Although I thought 6 was the end of Kiryu, I'm glad to finally get to play as him again in a new game. Plus, I think this game is one of the best games to come out, especially with all the side features and content that it has. Like a Dragon Gaiden is kind of like a mini game. It's supposed to bridge the gap between 6 and 7, and it's kind of like an appetizer for 8. I don't know how much of this game was planned when they were writing 6. They kind of want you to believe that it was all planned out in advance, but I don't really think that was the case. Anyways, let's get into the review. So this game takes place in Sotenbori and Ejincho. You're in Ejincho for a very, very, very small amount of time, and I'm surprised you can even go here because there's pretty much nothing to do. You don't even get to explore the full map, it's just a tiny little section, which I'm not really mad about. It's cool that you can go here, but there's really not any point. There is one other new place, which is the castle. It's basically a giant castle, so if that wasn't obvious, overseas. Instead of having the underground or the Colosseum somewhere like they did in the last games, it's literally out at sea. And it looks really elaborate. It's very bright. And this is where you have all your Colosseum, gambling, and cabaret clubs. So technically the only new place here is the castle. I think it definitely was a cool place that they added. This is kind of interesting because Kiryu is pretty much a spy. Like there's a whole section where he's going around shooting people and then using this special gadget to zip around like Spider-Man. Which is pretty crazy because most of the other games are pretty down to earth. This game almost feels like it's not canon. He has a gadget that shoots out webs and you can use it to find items and you can also use it in combat. It's pretty cool. You'll look up and see something way high up and you can grab it down. Normally it's like locker keys and stuff like that. But you can also use it in combat to pull enemies closer to you. There's two combat styles in this. There's the spy and then the dragon. So the dragon is of course your normal Kiryu fighting style. And then there's the agent style. This is where you use all your high tech gadgets and stuff like that. And like I said, you can use the webbing to basically pull enemies closer to you, but it's pretty much completely useless. You can pull in multiple enemies if you want to, but if it's anything other than a, the normal smallest enemy type, you can't pull them in. You can get upgrades for this, but it, it never got any easier, especially if there's a boss. You can't pull them with it. Most of the time, you'll just get yourself hurt. Like you'll try and web them in and then they'll just pull you close and punch you or something like that. The webbing is a cool idea but I found it pretty much useless in combat. You get drones that you can deploy and they don't do a lot of damage but you can send out multiple drones and they'll kind of distract enemies. If they're blocking a lot you can send out multiple drones and they'll try and fight them off which gives you an opening to attack. These were actually pretty useful. I found myself using the drones a lot. You get a cigarette that when you throw it, it basically blows people up. This was really good for crowd control. When you're fighting a group of like 10 enemies, you can just throw a cigarette in the middle of them and send them all flying. It actually does pretty good damage too. The last gadget you have is the serpent shoes, which are basically just jetpacks on your shoes. This is completely broken. If you're trying to complete this game, there's a completion for destroying a certain amount of items. Wait until you get the serpent shoes, because you can literally just zip around a room. It doesn't matter if you destroy items by breaking them on people or just running into them. So I used the serpent shoes and I was destroying like 20 things at once. You can also run through enemies, and most of the combat I did towards the end of the game, I would just run through the enemies with the serpent shoes, because it takes away about half of their health. It takes a long time before it runs out, so you can just run back and forth and just send enemies flying. It's really satisfying, and it's probably the quickest way to take enemies out as well. You can also activate heat while you're in agent mode, and all of your gadgets do a crazy amount of damage. The cigarette in this mode is completely overpowered. Everything is overpowered while you're in ultimate heat mode, but... The cigarette especially was really good for crowd control. The dragon style is kind of what you expect from a Kiryu fighting style. It does a lot more damage than agent style. Whenever you're fighting one on one, dragon style is always better. But when there's a big crowd, you want to switch to agent. I felt like it was cool that each fighting style had the best use case. One other thing I wanted to mention about the combat is the tiger drop. I, I think it's terrible here. In Lost Judgment, the tiger drop was like my favorite move. You get it towards the end of the game. I played through on New Game Plus and found it to be really fun to try and use the Tiger Drop. But here, it's just 
It felt almost impossible to get it off consistently. I feel like I could just never get the timing right. It almost felt like I was playing with lag. You can get the tiger drop extremely early in the game, and I did. I saved up all my money and points to get it the first chance I possibly could, and I really tried to use it, but I just, I couldn't. I hated it. Also, I have to say, I'm not really a big fan of the one-on-one -on -one fights. In Lost Judgment, maybe that spoiled me. The combat was so good, I didn't want to use any health items. I wanted to beat every boss without using anything I considered cheap. But here, I felt like I constantly was getting my ass kicked. Bosses do a lot of damage, and I feel like you're kind of required to use a good set of armor. You get gear in this game, and it really feels like it's necessary. Armor does a lot more in this game than it does in the other ones. The final boss fight, I actually lost quite a few times, and I didn't feel like I was getting any better at it. There was also no checkpoint, so at a certain point I didn't want to sit through a bunch of unskippable cutscenes when I was fighting him over and over again, so eventually I just used all my health items. That's also something that's kind of interesting about this game. I think there's two quick time events in the entire game, maybe a couple more, but there was not very many. I know some people don't like QTEs, but for Yakuza games, they were kind of iconic. And for boss fights, it's really fun to wait for that perfect moment to hit a QTE, and either you do a bunch of damage to the boss, or the boss does a bunch of damage to you if you miss it. And here, there was a bunch of cutscenes where it looked like there was supposed to be a quick time event, but there never was. <laughs> It actually caught me really off guard the first time there was one because I thought there weren't going to be any and then all of a sudden I had to hit a button and I think I missed it. And here the quick time events can't really help you, they can only hurt you. So if you hit it perfectly it's just like okay you don't take damage. But one thing that was cool about the other Yakuza games is that if you do hit the quick time events perfect, you can do a bunch of damage to the boss. And it really felt like there was a lot of moments where there were supposed to be quick time events but there just weren't. So I almost wonder if that's something they took out of the game. Also, one really, really annoying thing that the game brought in with Judgment, enemies will kind of get an aura, and when they do, it means they're about to do a move that's going to do a lot of damage to you, pretty much. But if you dodge it, it slows down time, and then you can do like a special move against them. It's a cool concept when used sparingly, but here, every fucking enemy in the game had this special aura move. And if you're in the middle of a combo, you're not going to be able to dodge in time. Also, if an enemy has like one more hit left and they go into this aura mode, you can't do anything against them. So there was a few times where I beat an enemy, but they wouldn't go down because they had their stupid aura. So whenever I saw that, I basically had to wait for them to finish their stupid move so that I could finally take them out. There was quite a few times where I should have been able to take an enemy out sooner, but they were doing their aura, so I had to wait. Also, it's not hard to dodge the aura as long as you see it coming. You can pretty much mash X, which is what I did every time, and you'll automatically dodge it. So yeah, this was fun when it was used on like special bosses and special encounters, but it's every fucking encounter has a dude that does the aura, to the point that it just got really annoying. Overall, I wasn't too crazy about the combat in this game. But speaking on the combat, I guess I should talk about... So in Coliseum you get four modes. Tournament, Hell Rumble, Special Event Match, and Hell Team Rumble. Tournament is like the classic mode. You either fight three or four fighters in a row, or you just fight one fighter that's at a rank at a certain level. So there's bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. Hell Rumble has the same tiers, but in this one you fight a bunch of enemies all at once. And normally they're pretty low level enemies, and there might be one or two bosses. Special Event Match was really cool. These are special encounters where you might fight past bosses from other games, or you might do a gambling match where you can bet as much money as you want, and if you win, you win that money. They also had Mr. Try and Hit Me, which is the staple of the game. But one of the special matches is you get to fight against Daigo, Saijima, and Majima. And these were actually really hard too. And finally there's Hell Team Rumble, which is probably the funnest and the one that will take the most time. Here you put together a team of as much as 10 allies, and you unlock allies throughout the game. There's also a few that are DLC, and you can play as every character you unlock. So as a pre-order bonus, I got Daigo, Saijima, and Majima as characters in this mode. You can also play as these characters in Hell Rumble and Tournament. Majima was absolutely amazing for this. 
Majima has a move where he spins around with his knife and it, you can't do anything against it. Every game where you play as Majima, he has some spin to win move and this is his spin to win move in this. Not only does it do a bunch of damage, but it also causes bleed, which makes an enemy basically slowly lose health throughout the fight. A lot of these matches were supposed to take you like a minute or two minutes to beat and with Majima I was able to beat them in like 15 seconds. He was really overpowered. That's another thing I should mention. All of these matches have rankings. You pretty much just have to beat them for all the completion points, but I did go through the effort of getting an S rank on every match. The hardest of which was Hell Team Rumble on Platinum. Here you really have to have a team that's completely maxed out. When playing as a team, they have their overall level of 1 to 20, and they also have their bond, which goes from 1 to 3. You need both of these maxed out in order to have like a perfect fighter. And then different fighters have different ranks. And of course you want gold fighters, over bronze. And in platinum you really need to have all gold fighters level 20 with their bond with Kiryu maxed out. Every fighter has different skills as well. Some are better for melee and then some are just for healing. I found that the best team was to have all melee fighters with two healers and then of course I had Saichima because you can't go without having Saichima even though he's a more defensive player. And once I had this team and I had them close to maxed out the platinum fights became a lot easier. You also get a shitload of money for Hell Team Rumble. I hope they have something like this in Yakuza 8. Without even trying, I was able to get millions of yen, to the point that I bought everything I possibly could and still had about 50 million yen left over, without even trying to grind for money. The only frustrating part about this is if you lose a fight, or if a fighter gets knocked out during a fight, the next fight they'll be groggy, and they only have half their health. So if this happens during a platinum fight, it just means you need to go back to a bronze fight so you can get all your fighters out of that groggy mode so that they're coming in at full health for the platinum fight. This was really annoying too because they have to be in a fight or you have to do a hell team rumble fight. If you go to do a different type of fight, they'll still be groggy. And it just felt like a waste of time when you're trying to get S rank on all the platinums and you have to keep going back to the bronze fights just to get your fighters back to have another attempt. Also they brought back the most annoying thing from any Coliseum fight which is that if you lose, you lose all your health. So you have to go get something to eat or use health drinks. And here, there's not really anywhere to go eat, so you pretty much just have to bring a bunch of healing items with you. Which is just really annoying and it should not have been in this game. It's annoying in every Coliseum mode that they try and implement it. If you lose a fight, you want to have another attempt. You don't want to have to go find a restaurant somewhere and then come back every time you lose. There's also a sub-story attached to Coliseum mode where you fight the four kings. These are like the castle's four big fighters. You have to beat them in a one-on-one -on -one match and then beat them in a Hell Team Rumble. They have a story attached to them as well and the person that makes your gadgets, they kind of stole from him. It was kind of interesting, and it was nice that they added a little story mode to the Coliseum. So you don't really get sub-stories in this game. There are some sub-stories, but they're all associated with the four kings of the Coliseum. Instead, you get the Akame tasks. And Akame is a new character that kind of runs Sotenbori, and she'll give you tasks where someone needs some help around town. They're basically sub-stories, but they're just called something different here. Some of these were kind of lame. There's three different gangs throughout Sotenbori, and you basically have to go around town and beat them up until their leader comes out, then you beat them up, and then you move on to the next gang. And that happens three times. It wasn't really too interesting, but it was fine. There were also a few tasks where it required you to just go all around town, like there's one where this hostess is not doing well at his job, so you're supposed to go and find out and talk to his customers. So you talk to all his customers and then you find out that someone's been spreading rumors about him, so then you have to go around town and talk to people that might have spread the rumors, and then you, it's just a lot of busy work that wasn't really fun. And from the beginning of the story, it was very easy to piece together what the ending was going to be, but you still had to run around for like 15 minutes talking to all these people until Kiryu can figure it out. There was one sub-story where you have to work with Kaito from Judgment, which was pretty cool. But I do think it's funny that Yagami can't even show up to his own DLC, and now Kaito is the one that gets to meet Kiryu. But honestly, it's kind of cool that Kaito is getting more fleshed out. I like Kaito, he's pretty cool. But the rest of the side stories or Akame missions were really funny. I was wondering how the humor of Yakuza would translate to 2023, and there's definitely a lot of missions where you have to deal with streamers and vloggers and stuff like that. And seeing an old Kiryu having to deal with these people is pretty fucking funny. Mm. Mm. <sighs> uh. 
Tschüss. So once you beat all the sub-stories and Akame missions plus do all the Colosseum, you have to fight a bunch of robots that were trained to fight like Amon. Of course they don't measure up, but then Amon himself shows up. Well, this time it's Guy Amon. This was a pretty good Amon fight. It didn't feel unfair and it was definitely hard to try and beat him down. I actually lost this the first time because I tried to just beat the shit out of him. And because I wasn't paying attention, he was able to get a combo on me and kill me pretty much instantly. So you do have to pay attention. So overall it was a pretty good fight. So Akame also has requests throughout town, and I absolutely love these, and I hope they bring them back in the next game. I mentioned in Yakuza 3, my favorite part was that there was a bunch of tiny little contained sub-stories. You didn't have to go around town and talk to 50 different people about why the hostess is not doing well. You show up, you talk to them, you finish the sub-story. You show up, you beat somebody up, you finish the sub-story. And that's pretty much what these were. They're one-off encounters where you talk to somebody, they tell you what they need, and then you give it to them. Sometimes they need a snack, sometimes they want takoyaki, but they all had these little stories and some of them were actually pretty funny. There's one where a girl has something stuck up in a tree and she wants you to help her get it. So you use your webbing to get it down and she somehow got her panties stuck up in the tree, which is pretty funny. And they also brought back the dude in the toilet that needs some tissues, which is just a classic. There is kind of a final Akame mission that's basically the Dragon Balls. You have to get seven golden balls scattered around Sonbari. Some of these you buy in the store. Some of these you'll find somewhere that's kind of hard to reach. There's a giant statue of a dude and one of the balls is literally underneath his whatever the fuck he's wearing. There's another one that's on a dude's crotch, so they're literally balls. But anyways, once you get all seven, this dude wants to grant you a wish. And you have four options. One is for a normal peaceful life, which of course, he's like, I can't do that for you. One is Endless Riches, which is a million yen. That's pretty much one fight in the Hell Team Rumble, so don't pick that one. One is Sexy Panties, which is really funny, and you should probably make a save before you do this and run through all of them, because all of them are pretty funny. The best one you can pick is Eternal Life. So like I said, you have to heal when you're at the Colosseum, and you can only hold like three health drinks, but they have a new form of health called Nourishment of the whatever, and these work the same way, but you can hold a hundred of them. So if you choose Eternal Life, He'll give you 100 Nourishment of the Sea King, which charge your heat and heal you. And I used 40 of these in Colosseum. Not only were these good for getting health if I lost a match, but I could also charge my heat to max, that way I could come into a match with full heat. So if you're going for completion or just want to do all the Hell Team Rumble stuff, definitely choose Eternal Life. So there's a lot of stuff for completion that's given to you by Akame. This is basically your completion list. And of course there's one for going to all the restaurants and eating and eating all the different items. There's one for giving Akame cigarettes 10 times. Randomly as you talk to her, she'll have the option of giving her a gift of cigarettes. If you do that 10 times, there's a point for that. There's also games in this. You get a Sega Master System and you can find games in various places. And you get points for playing every single game, of which there are 12. I didn't play these too much, but it's cool that they were there. There's a bunch of battle completion points. And most of these you'll get throughout the game. There's one called Object Annihilator where you have to destroy a thousand objects. And like I said, if you're going for this, wait until you have the Serpent upgrade for your shoes and just break all the items you can every time you get into a fight by just running into them. Mahjong is back, of course. And I've noticed whenever there's a Mahjong challenge where they just want you to get a certain hand, it's not too bad. Whenever they want you to place first at every table, it's a fucking nightmare. And it was no different here. You have to place first at a royal table of Mahjong, which is the hardest, as well as hard, normal, and easy. This was miserable. Of course the royal table was hard because that's the hardest, but easy was not any easier. This was hard as shit. And I actually was missing Mahjong because it had been a while since I played it, so I've been playing it a lot on my own. And I've gotten really good at it, not to flex. But then I play a fucking Yakuza game and I can't get a hand to save my fucking life. It is absolutely broken in these games. Mahjong is a great game, don't let the Yakuza version put you off of Mahjong. The claw machine is back and some of these are like a real Japanese arcade where you have to nudge the prize towards the opening like a hundred times to get it to fall in. And there's a lot of prizes this time. It felt more tedious than fun. Pocket circuit is back and it works exactly the same as it did in Zero. If there's any difference, I did not notice it. I can't say I'm a fan of pocket circuit. The way pocket circuit works is you build your car and then you race it while trying not to fall off the tracks and getting first. There's a boost. And just like in every other game, if you use the boost, there's a 99% chance you're going to go flying off the track. 
It's also really annoying making a bunch of different versions of a car to try and win only to fly off the track, especially because you can have a cart that's going to win and it just flies off the track anyways. There was one that I was really struggling on and I looked up the right car in order to win and I kept losing over and over again, which is when I realized it's completely random. You can have the right car and it's going to take you 20 tries in order to win. I played the same track over and over and over and over again, flying off over and I thought I was doing something wrong. This can't be the right car. And then eventually I went through and I wobbled a little bit but didn't fall off and got first. And that's how a lot of these wore. Once I realized that, you just have to play them over and over again until you don't fall off. But they did bring back the Pocket Circuit Master, which is kind of cool. I like that Pocket Circuit is in these games, but I wish they would refine it a little bit and just make it less random. Karaoke is here. There's only six songs, but I think a couple of these are new songs. Plus they have a song from Ishin as well. Golf is here, and I normally love golf, but this time it got kind of frustrating. There's a bingo challenge, which isn't too bad. You have to hit the bingo board, but the hard part is that it moves back and forth, and then wind will blow your ball a certain way, which makes it hard to hit a certain spot. But it never got too difficult. Closest to the pin, though, was pretty ridiculous towards the end. It's exactly what it sounds like. There's a pin somewhere, and you have to get as close as you can. What makes it difficult is that the wind changes, and as you get to the advanced mode, they start putting obstacles in your way. And I swear some of these just aren't possible. I missed like half of the shots and still was able to get an A ranking, so I do feel like you're just supposed to miss some of these. The pin will be directly in the path of multiple objects, and there's absolutely no way to get through and get to the pin. The only thing I was able to figure out is that you can curve the ball, but it's so imprecise and it doesn't show you where it's going to go. I almost feel like I'm missing something, like there must be a way to show you the path that the ball is going to curve. But as it was, this was really, really difficult. There's a bunch of arcades in this game. You get Virtua Fighter, Sonic the Fighters, Fighting Vipers 2, Motor Raid, and Sega Racing Classic. These were actually really fun, and the challenges weren't too hard for them either. And I actually really like Fighting Vipers. And there's one dude that's literally Jotaro. He was my favorite. It's a pretty fun game. Darts is back, and it's pretty simple. Once you get a decent pair of darts, of which there's like 10 different darts, once you get a decent pair, it becomes really easy. You can also invite people to darts to play against them. Gambling is back. The casino has blackjack and poker. And then the gambling hall has Koi Koi and Oicho Kabu. These were pretty fun in this one. I actually was able to get all the completion without even using cheat items. Well, except for blackjack, but, but blackjack wasn't hard. The cheat item is just really overpowered in that. It gives you like five blackjacks in a row. Shogi is here. That's all I have to say about it. You can do the same challenge mode over and over again to win. And finally, finally, they brought back pool. And I don't like it. The normal mode isn't too bad, but then they have a challenge mode where you have to try and hit the ball in by hitting another ball into it without hitting any of the balls on the side. And here it's just so precise. The game doesn't give you the precision needed in order to make it in. I would shoot the ball and be just barely off. So I'd use the D-pad and just barely tap it the other direction and then I would be way off to the other side. The trick is you have to use the joystick and just barely move it back and forth until you get it to the perfect position but it just became more frustrating than fun. Literally, just the tiniest little millimeter is enough to throw your ball completely off. So I was not a fan of the challenge mode in this. Luckily, they don't require you to do anything too challenging. But I think overall, it was a pretty good mix of minigames, and I actually had a lot of fun with this. The arcade and the minigames and the Sega Master System was a really cool addition. Cabaret Club is an improvement in every way. They have real videos of girls, so if you enjoyed the previous cabaret dates, you'll love these. These are not for me. I never liked these, and while this is an improvement, I still don't like it. It's kind of weird, too. Anyways, I can't complain about this because you can skip literally everything. Someone at RGG was watching my videos. This is everything I wanted in a cabaret date. You can max out a girl in less than 5 minutes by just skipping everything. You don't have to sit through their boring dialogue anymore, so it has my official stamp of approval. Oh, apparently this girl is a streamer or something? I used a walkthrough to get past the dates, and she had more guides than any other girl, so I'm assuming she's somewhat popular. Your reward for maxing out the affection is a PG-13 video of the girl you romance as you spend some time alone together. Unfortunately, since Kiryu's a virgin, we all know nothing happens here. Overall, this game did not take me long to complete. 
I hope that 8 has something that's similar to this because nothing in here felt over the top. The only time I really felt annoyed was with the pool. You have to win 20 matches and get a bunch of points and after 10 I was just completely done with pool. Which is funny because pool used to be my favorite minigame but I think I was kind of burned out after the challenge mode. So I think it took me 40 hours overall to complete everything which if you've completed a Yakuza game that is not much at all. Yakuza 0 took me about 3 times that. Which makes sense, this is not considered to be a full Yakuza release. But the best part about this game was how easy it was to make money. And I also felt like by the end of the game, I had plenty of points. One thing I didn't mention is the Akame network. Akame will sell you stuff using Akame points, and Akame points are also what you use to level up. By the end of the game, I had more than enough Akame points to max everything out and buy everything I wanted from Akame store. I hope they don't get stingy with the money in the next game, because this was really nice not having to worry about points or money. When you do complete everything, you get absolutely nothing. You know, playing through the remasters of 3, 4, and 5, it's kind of fucked up that like literally every point of completion gets you a reward. And they could have done it for this. There's a bunch of gear and special items and you could have unlocked something for everything that you did. But they don't have that here. So what really is the point of completing everything? You can easily get the trophies without doing half of this stuff. So what's the point of doing completion? It doesn't even like give you a star showing you you did it. Also speaking of items, you can't carry weapons in this game. Which I know I complained about the weapons, but it's kind of a staple of the series at this point. It's kind of weird that they would take it out. Also the heat actions are really 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 lackluster in this. There's not even half the heat action in this game that there were in the others. You can find a pair of pliers that has two special heat actions, is reused from the other games. But other than that, almost every single item has a very generic heat action. You used to be able to get crates in the other games and put them on someone's head and smack it back and forth over and over again. Here you just hit them with the, with the crate. It really feels like they half-assed the heat actions in this game. And I think I see why. This whole combat and everything is only going to be used for this specific game. Because when Like a Dragon 8 comes out, the combat is going to be turn-based. So I guess they didn't want to make a bunch of heat actions when they're not really going to get used long-term anyways. But it did feel really lame and it did make the combat feel repetitive. Also I forgot to mention there's no Legend difficulty and there's no New Game Plus. So you pretty much only get one playthrough out of this. What the fuck? I'm not sure what the plan was after 6. I came into the series with Kiwami and at that time 6 was already out. Even so, I was under the impression 6 was supposed to be Kiryu's last game. I was so sure of it that I assumed Kiryu died at the end of 6 going into it. I'll save my full thoughts for 6 when I make that video, but I absolutely hated the ending. Basically, Daidoji is a politician and one of the antagonists of 6. Kiryu finds out Daidoji is involved in some bad stuff that could ruin his reputation. So one of Daidoji's lackeys offers Kiryu hush money. Kiryu tells him, instead of giving him money and letting him go on his merry way, he'll pretend to die and disappear. He says it's to protect Haruka and the other children of the orphanage, even though if not for him, they all wouldn't have an orphanage and most of them would be dead anyways. Like I said, I hate the ending of Six, but without getting sidetracked, that's his reason for faking his death. So I'm not sure if Six was supposed to be the final game and they changed their mind, or if this was the plan all along to bring Kiryu back. I highly doubt that and it kind of shows in the story of Gaiden. I'm not sure when they decided Kiryu would come back, but literally the next Yakuza game after 6, Kiryu shows up again. So much for giving Kiryu a send off. Yakuza Gaiden is supposed to serve as a bridge between 6 and 7, and kind of 6 and 8 as well. And it takes place the same time as Yakuza 7, only from Kiryu's perspective. In Gaiden, we find out that Kiryu didn't disappear like they led you to believe at the end of 6. He became the Daidoji faction's slave, pretty much. So instead of taking money and going off into the sunset, Kiryu instead decided to make all of his loved ones think he died and spend the rest of his days serving the Daidoji faction, which he already knows are corrupt. Oh, and since he died for the Daidoji, if anyone discovers he's alive, they'll kill him. And his loved ones at the orphanage. Wow, great fucking job protecting Haruka, Kiryu. I'm glad he faked his death to save the kids at the orphanage. Well, I'm glad Kiryu is back because I didn't like his send-off in 6. But if you like 6, that must feel like a huge slap in the face. The whole reason he faked his death is to protect Haruka, and all through Gaiden, they're telling him if he doesn't do what they tell him, they'll kill Haruka. もしもし? 
もう切りますよアラートを出せば即座にこうした体制が取れる So what the fuck was the point? That's also why I feel this was a last minute change to get Kiryu back. I can't imagine they had this in mind when writing Six. With that aside, Kiryu is now living at a temple, goes by the name of Joryu, with a priest that's very clearly got something more going on. We'll get to that later. Hanawa is Kiryu's handler and Kiryu can't fucking stand him. He gives Kiryu a mission to stand by and watch while the Daidoji do a trade at the docks. He's basically there to be muscle if anything goes wrong. Kiryu's extremely reluctant to do another job, and Hanawa's like, bro, you signed up for this. True. So the trade ends up being a double cross, and some thugs try to kidnap Hanawa in the midst of it. One of them ends up recognizing Kiryu. <laughs> Kiryu is only on this mission because they forced him to, and because he went on this mission, he got recognized. And throughout the next couple chapters, Kiryu keeps saying, I have no idea who Kiryu is, I'm Joryu. And it seems really goofy, especially when they clearly know he's Kiryu. But as it turns out, later on, he's given an ultimatum of kill everyone that recognizes him, or they'll kill the kids of the orphanage. What the fuck? For now, Kiryu keeps it secret that someone recognized him. He goes to a Jincho to figure out who was trying to kidnap Hanawa. Turns out, it was the Omi Alliance, always up to no good. Mainly, Suruno, a captain, and his lieutenant Shishido, a man that wears a mask because his face is covered in scars. The Omi want Kiryu to come work for them. They knew Kiryu dying was bullshit, and their plan was to kidnap Hanawa to make him talk and tell them where Kiryu was. Since Kiryu just so happened to be with Hanawa anyways, they kidnapped Hanawa to make Kiryu hear them out and give Kiryu a burner phone so they can call him later. Kiryu reports this back to the Daidoji, and they basically tell him Hanawa should have already killed himself, and if he hasn't, then he's not a true Daidoji, and he's not worth saving anyways. Remember, Kiryu chose to work for these people. So Kiryu does what Kiryu's gonna do and beats everyone up to save Hanawa, with a little help from the priest. He meets Sudano to try and get back Hanawa, and this is where the plot starts to get really goofy. Kiryu is only meeting Sudano to get Hanawa back. He knows this. Sudano calls Hanawa valuable because he knows Kiryu will do whatever he tells him as long as he has Hanawa. So, Sudano's big plan is to kill Hanawa and fake Kiryu's death so that Kiryu can work for the Omi. <laughs> その状況に説得力を持たせるには花輪さんの死体も必要です<笑>別にええやないですか Are you recorded? So Kiryu turns that down because Of course, the whole reason he's here is to save Hanawa Why would he accept an offer that involves killing Hanawa? Suruno gives Kiryu a red tiger and tells him to seek out Akame He finds Akame which is a pretty cool character She kind of runs Sonbori like the florist And the red tiger gets Kiryu into a coliseum fight because of course it does. And the Colosseum here reenact famous Yakuza events from the past. One of which being Kiryu fighting a bunch of people in Kamurocho, and even ends with a fight against fake Ryuji, or as he's called here, Lil Ryuji. After winning the fight, Shishido meets with Kiryu and tells him where Hanawa is being held. That seems kind of easy, but the twist is, Shishido knew Kiryu would go there, and he has a bunch of low-level thugs there to fight him off. こっちの要件は分かってるはずだ。花輪はどこにいる。最上階で頭と一緒におりますわ。けど、アントニアまず。こいつらは失礼の内容をしっかりおもてなしします<笑> <laughs> I get that it's a game, but isn't it funny that everyone knows who Kiryu is and how legendary of a fighter he is, yet everyone thinks they can just kick his ass? Like at this point in the series, they're having Colosseum battles to show how much of a badass he is. The Omi think he's so cool that they don't believe he died, but everyone thinks that a couple of thugs are going to be enough to take him out. I love it. Anyways, Kiryu saves Hanawa, and they take Sunono back to Daidochi headquarters to be interrogated. The reason the Omi want Kiryu's help is because they know the Yakuza can't stick around much longer. Watase, the leader of the Omi, is getting out of prison soon, 
When he does, he plans on disbanding the Omi, and the Tojo also plan on disbanding. They'd rather go out on their own terms than be owned by the police, and they can see the writing on the wall. They need Kiryu for protection as they make this announcement. Kiryu still doesn't want to help because Suruno is still adamant that Hanawa has to die. Kiryu's not down with that, that's kind of his whole thing. So Kiryu and Hanawa take all this back to the Daidoji and they're like, Okay Kiryu, we know you saved one of us and showed extreme loyalty, but your identity has been revealed, so you need to kill everyone that knows you're alive, which is 25 people. Remember a couple seconds ago about Kiryu not killing? That's his thing, that's his whole deal. So he lets Suruno escape, but the Daidoji show that they have men outside his orphanage waiting for the signal to kill everyone in the orphanage. So Kiryu relents and gives up. They tell Hanawa he has to kill Kiryu, but he can't do it because Kiryu saved his life. So that means they both die. But it turns out, the gun was empty all along. The leader of the Daidoji shows up and says it was all a big test. Ha! Gotcha! He was really happy Kiryu and Hanawa had such a good bond, that's all! He had to force Hanawa to shoot Kiryu at gunpoint with an empty gun as a test, no big deal. Also, the Omi bought Kiryu's little ass for 50 billion yen, so now he has no choice but to work for them. So now Kiryu is helping the Omi disband. The biggest roadblock is that the dude that owns the castle, Nishitani, doesn't want that to happen. Since he's always in his castle, they decide to draw him out by spending crazy amounts of money in a pretty badass scene. <laughs> They eventually track down Nishitani and the plan is to grab him and hold him somewhere until they disband the Yakuza so he can't interrupt. Shishido has other plans and stabs Nishitani while Kiryu isn't looking. Kiryu is pissed but it's kind of too late now, plus Nishitani is kind of a dick. So now everything is in place to finally disband the Omi. Watase is released from prison, but turns out Shishido was double crossing them all along. And Nishitani is still alive! Shishido said he basically used a collapsible knife and ketchup packets to make it look like he stabbed him. That's some Scooby Doo bullshit. Anyways, they aren't gonna let Watase disband the Omi. Luckily, that's what Kiryu is here for. Kiryu fights his way through some thugs and eventually makes it to Yakuza HQ. This is where we get to see the scene from Seven from Kiryu's perspective. After dissolving the Omi and Tojo, a huge fight breaks out and Kiryu comes in like a badass to protect Watase. Majima gets to see his lover again and pretty much knew Kiryu was alive. <laughs> Everyone knew Kiryu was still alive. This is the dumbest shit. This part almost felt like contractually they're not allowed to have Kiryu admit he's Kiryu. Like everyone is really happy to see him again and he just acts completely emotionless and says, nah, I'm Joryu. Kiryu-san。わかりました。I'm pretty sure the boys aren't about to blow your cover if you ask them. Plus, they pretty much knew you were alive anyways. Whatever, you get to fight with the boys again, which is pretty badass. The final boss is Shishido, and after beating him, the Daidoji kidnap him and basically imply him and Nishitani are their new slaves. <laughs> I know they're the antagonists of this game, but the Daidoji are pretty scary. So with everything wrapped up, Kuyu returns to his shrine to sit and stare until he's taken off his shelf again to be used. Hanawa decides to show him a camera they set up at his grave, where he gets to see the kids from his orphanage pay their respects. 
おじさんが見るかもしんないんだろえダメでもともと別にいいじゃんうーんねえおじさん俺のことを分かる太一それに綾子姉ちゃんこっちはみんな元気はるか姉ちゃんもはるともねシロンも泉も浩二光雄リオナエリみんな元気だしそれに実はみんなおじさんが死んだなんて信じてなかったりする And none of them believe he's dead. What the fuck was the point? Taichi and Ayako notice the camera and pretty much know Kiryu set it up, or at least has something to do with it, and they give Kiryu a message. They also bring him a picture Haruto drew, which makes Kiryu completely break down. ハルト。見ろよ4歳ってのはもう字が書けんのか最後に会った時あいつはまだ喋れもしなかったのなのに立派にやってますよはるかさんも他の子たちも This is probably the most emotional moment in the whole franchise I'll admit I got choked up here But Hanawa is still adamant that he can't go see anyone. It's fucking dumb. He basically tells him, well, you can go on a vacation, but that's it. So Kiryu decides to go to Hawaii, which is a setup for Yakuza 8. Excuse me, like a dragon, infinite wealth. So overall, I really did like Like a Dragon Gaiden. I think the story was decent. My only complaints are that it's, it's, it's fucking stupid that he has to pretend that he's dead. If the point was that he's trying to protect Haruka, In the orphanage, they have never been in more danger than they have been in Like a Dragon Gaiden. Fucking everybody is like, I'm gonna kill them, I'm gonna kill them. The Omi are even like, oh, we're gonna wait outside here and kill them. They have never been in more danger than when Kiryu died to protect them. Plus, the Daidoji seem kind of like pricks. They're willing to let one of their own members die and say he should have killed himself, and if he didn't, that he's not honorable or some shit. That's fucking dumb. These are bad guys. The Daidoji are 100% bad guys, which Kiryu already knew, and now he's working for them. Kiryu is definitely doing stuff he is not okay with because he's working for the Daidoji. And while he's not directly killing anybody, he's enabling the Daidoji to do whatever they want, pretty much. It's been revealed from the trailers of 8, and if you don't want any spoilers for that, just go ahead and click off now. But it's in the trailers. Kiryu has cancer. But I am very excited because we've already seen in the trailer Akiyama san is back, Date san is back. Kiryu gets to meet with Date san. Sayama is back. If you watch my Yakuza 3 or Yakuza 2 video, you know I'm fucking hyped as shit about. And Haruka is talking in the trailer. Hopefully, he at least gets to have some type of reunion. But they kind of establish already he's not going to beat cancer. I hope he at least gets to have his final days in the orphanage. I hope he gets to get out of the Daidoji's grasp. I honestly think it's kind of stupid he didn't get to meet with them in Like a Dragon Gaiden. Maybe this is supposed to be the appetizer before Yakuza 8. When he really gets to meet up with them. If he doesn't, then fuck this whole franchise. I'm very hopeful that he's gonna get to meet up with them. At least one last time. But it is gonna be kind of fucked up if he meets with Haruka and is like, guess what? I'm not dead, but I am dying. So hopefully he is able to beat cancer or at least have a few more years. And Kamaki is still alive and he gets to meet up with him. If Kamaki can be that old, why can't Kiryu be the Kamaki of his generation? Tell me that wouldn't be badass. You go to Okinawa. 
as a new protagonist to meet up with some old master and it's fucking Kiryu. But I think this game did its job of getting me hyped as shit for Yakuza 8. I think this is going to be the first Yakuza game where I just play straight through the story, beeline to the end, because I want to know what happened before I do any of the side content. So that's about it. Yakuza 5 is probably going to wait for a little while, because I think Infinite Wealth is going to come out before I can finish that. Goodbye. Okay,